Welcome everyone. We have a very special webinar today. Um, we have uh, uh, Ms. Manon Frenet from the Ministry. She'll be joining us for the first few minutes. Uh, she came to say hello. And of course, our guest speaker, our guest facilitator, Professor Tom Cobb, who um, is from UCAM and uh, works well. I'll pass the floor over to you um, in a little bit if you just kind of want to give a, a snippet of your bio, but uh, we're really glad you guys all came to join us today. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Professor Cobb. And uh, let's, let's talk about vocabulary in English as a Second Language. So you, of course, have experience as teaching, uh, teaching English as a foreign language in Middle East and Hong Kong, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you discovered some uh, gaps in the students' vocabulary, which present, uh, prevented them from succeeding in their exit exams and prevented them from succeeding in their further post-secondary courses in their specific careers. And with the research, correct me if I'm wrong, produced by Nation and a few other linguists um, of that time, uh, you guys were able to develop some tools to help uh, understand the levels of vocabulary in the material that the students were presented versus the actual level of vocabulary that the students know. Is that correct? Absolutely correct, yeah. I would say that it's more ESL than EFL out there because they are going to uh, use English in their university studies for a number of years. So, uh, you know, it's a debate, but I would call it ESL. And yeah, using tools, we found that uh, there was a terrible mismatch between what the students knew and what they were being tested on, particularly with regard to vocabulary. Not only, but vocabulary was the most approachable element that we could deal with. Well, I think the teachers that, that deal um, with our program will probably agree. We all see students and they have, uh, they might be in secondary five, but they have a lot of difficulty with reading comprehension and vocabulary. So we, we definitely can relate. So what were the actions that you, you took to address that situation and what was the outcome? Well, the action was basically a needs analysis. Um, we would use uh, testing, frequency-based testing, to find out which words they knew at which level. And uh, although they knew lots of vocabulary, it wasn't particularly organized such that they would know uncommon words but not know common words. So they would not know cat and dog and car and things like that, well, they knew maybe specialized terms from their studies from high school or someplace. So it was uh, basically uh, we set up courses for them to learn specifically in a focused way the vocabulary of, of common English, which is the first one or two thousand most common or most frequent words. And we set up lots of different ways to do this, including flashcards, computer software, and extensive reading of simplified novels. You know, numerous things to just really hit this uh, problem. And uh, it was quite successful. Once people had uh, been exposed to the vocabulary of common everyday English, then they could suddenly function. They could read and um, pass exams and uh, get on with their careers. But those were the basic things. And uh, but we have I, I developed numerous pieces of software that I've continued developing ever since that were specifically for them, for the learners, to be able to fill in that big gap they had in basic vocabulary. And I saw from one of the research papers on your on your website. Um, surprisingly, that the first 2,000 most common words in English are 70% um, or um, I think I'm getting my uh, facts mixed up here, but it was 70% of the words that students would need to know to function are part of only the first 2,000 most common words in English. Is that correct? It's actually it's more than that. It's, it's actually typically 80, but in conversation, and um, like maybe watching movies or TV, it could be even as much as 90%. So there's a, there's a 
core vocabulary to English that is really important. It's never less than 75%, even if you're reading um, advanced physics, because you know you, you need the common vocabulary for everything. But uh, yeah, so a couple of thousand, or maybe you could say 3,000, is really what they need, and the rest is kind of um, you know the cherry on the cake. But if they don't have those 3,000, then they're basically just reading texts with with one word missing in every line or even two words missing in every line, which, which means they can't get the precise meaning of anything. They might get the topic and they might fool the teacher that they're getting the meaning, but actually, unless they're lucky or unless they have a huge imagination, that those exist, um, the majority of students are not getting any precise meaning out of the text. Well, I think we can all think of uh, some students' work where we've seen where they can understand it, but they're still missing that rudimentary vocabulary. So uh, that uh, statistic really does emphasize the importance of just those first 3,000 most common words. What, what does research now say about the importance of vocabulary? Well, they do studies on um, the various things you should know to be able to read or function in other parts of English or any language. And they, they um, can, can find out like a person's vocabulary level, their grammar level, their familiarity with the general culture that the text comes from, the familiarity with a particular topic, and maybe up to 10 things that might be important for uh, understanding a text. And then they do a multiple regression analysis against where, where you take all those factors and put them against the score they would get on a reading test and find out which one or which ones are the most you know important. We say capturing the most variance, but this means which ones are you know are having the biggest effect. And vocabulary almost always is more than fifty percent of the total effect. And then familiarity with the topic, knowledge of grammar, and all that, and pronunciation, and all those other things about language knowledge get the, the other 50%. So vocab is 50% and up. And there are even studies that, I mean, there, there are groups of studies on this that sort of bring together maybe 20 studies that have all found something similar in, in a meta-analysis. But it's always at least 50%, but sometimes more, that vocabulary knowledge claims. But then, of course, it's a question of how, of what is knowledge. I mean, like superficial knowledge, like they could sort of tell you what a word means, or is it like reaction time for how quickly they can access the meaning? And so it gets kind of more complicated, but the basic thing is that knowledge of the words in a text is really what counts in ability to read. And the other stuff is, it's there, but it's much more minor. And, and it's quite interesting that we have been hitting grammar as if it was the big thing, whereas grammar is not the big thing. Grammar has a lot of importance, particularly in writing and in advanced write, reading, but vocab is what counts for learning how to read. And if a person learns how to read through their vocab knowledge, they will start picking up the grammar without particularly being taught it, although it doesn't hurt to teach it, but we've had it all kind of backwards. Too much grammar, not enough vocab, whereas now we see that vocab is, you know, the big thing. Make sense? I guess I'll... It's just a joke, but I guess I'll have to sell my grammar books. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, those. It's just a different just, stage. So grammar becomes important, you know, at at a later stage. Uh, pe people should learn. The first thing should be that they learn one or two thousand words, and that should happen pretty fast. Wh whether it's through flashcards, lists, or extensive reading, like reading of simplified stories. But it should happen fast, and then the rest is piling on top of that. Because without the, the vocab, 
grammar is virtually unlearnable. It just becomes learned as kind of you know nonsense if if it doesn't link to semantics. In other words, vocab. I mean, if you're, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland, right? Jabberwocky. Twas twas slithy the slithy toves did gyre and gamble in the wave. I mean, people can learn these uh, structures without having any meaning, and they can, they can even pass tests, but it doesn't help when they have to read or write or express themselves. Well, and I think that's what they call um, Im implicit, a form of implicit instruction where the student picks up grammar notions or other language notions through reading or exposure to media. Um, so it's it's good to know that the statistics show that that supports that uh, your vocabulary development. Um, so maybe later on, if we have time, uh, when you're showing us your website, perhaps you could uh, show the teachers the graded readers that you have for them to um, to use in their in their classrooms. Absolutely. And I've, I've kind of forgotten where they are too, so that would be great to have a refresher. Because um, I've, been... I've made a set of links which I'm going to show everybody the location of, uh, you know, at the right time. And, it, and their graded readers are all on there. And they're, they're easy to get. I'm not sure if they're supposed to be gone because they're all copyrighted, but anyway, they're on there. And anybody can get them. I heard nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so would you say that generally in the um, the global scheme of uh, language or English language instruction that vocabulary is becoming uh, increasingly important? I, I, I know before the webinar you were discussing that there's sort of two new hot topics, two new uh, flavors, because even um, CEFR, for those of you that uh, remember from one of the other websites, we talked about the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, so it's the uh, language framework that Europe uses for second language instruction. Uh, they've produced vocabulary lists, so uh, does that coincide with this being a common trend right now? Absolutely, it does, yeah. Um, the old theory used to be that people would learn vocabulary by themselves. They will pick it up because they did in their first language, so why wouldn't they? But the problem with that is that in your first language you have 15 years to pick up your vocabulary and in your second language typically you have a very short time. Particularly if it's to study, you know, if people want to go to McGill next year, they pretty well have to get in English quickly. And in all these places that I've worked, you know, it was one year for English. So not 15, but one. Anyway, if people uh, gave up on this idea that people got it for free, and then it was, well, they get some of it for free, but they also need to be explicitly taught it. And then the question becomes, well, taught what? And that's where this frequency thing comes in, because you need to teach people the words that they are going to need, and those are the ones which reappear repeatedly throughout any text or television show or anything. So that's where frequency can, can help us to determine what uh, vocab should be learned. And then, of course, ultimately people will become independent learners. But another topic that we are interested in right now is at what point do people become independent learners? And it's usually seen as being when they know 3,000 or 4,000 word families that they then become independent learners. Because when they have that many words in their head, then every new thing they learn they will be seeing only a few new words, maybe 2%. And then, yes, they will learn them because they're in the situation that a L1 child is in, just meeting a few new words and not, you know, half the text being new words. So these are the research topics that have you know, grabbed my interest, and not just mine, but lots of people's, because um, in May, or 
April, I'm going to a conference in Colorado. It's every year. It's the American Association of Applied Linguists. And vocab 10 years ago was hardly on the, the agenda, whereas now it is the most, you know, popular presentation topic. Like people come there and they present their research. You know, it's peer-reviewed research. And um, vocab is the thing which is now more popular than all the other things. And, you know, applied linguistics is a lot of different branches, like knowledge of culture and language policy and language law, so many things. But vocab will be the most popular of all those things. So, I mean, it's not because it's not a beauty contest. It's just that people are now interested in vocab because it's been quite clearly shown the importance of it. And the sort of tragedy that we ignored it for so long and made assumptions about learners' ability to get it for free. And when we started to give tests, we found out they don't get it for free uh, at all. <laughs> they get some of it for free, but definitely not enough. So it has to be approached systematically. And this coincides with the arrival of text computing. And with text computing, you can sort of slice and dice the language and find out which pieces are in it at what time and who needs what. And uh, so it's a kind of a marriage made in heaven, computer and text. At least that's what I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're really lucky to be in this era where technology is developed to the point that we can use them. So we are uh, really grateful that you and, and other linguists and have developed these tools that uh, we get to use and to do our jobs better. So we're right. really appreciative of, of all of this research that's taking place. It sounds really revolutionary. It really Colorado. is. But on, uh, I've got to tell you that it's, it's, it's sort of disappointing in a way also because it's not that simple to put all this into action. You know, the, the whole book publishing industry and all the language learning software and all that kind of stuff is quite um, back in 40, 50 years ago. And uh, it doesn't like, it doesn't claim to be based on research and it doesn't like to be researched itself because uh, it basically wants to sell uh, software and sell books and, and and the less people know better they like it so it, to to implement some of these ideas that, that the researchers like me talk about would be not that simple and I don't know if there's any place in the world that's actually done it 100 percent people tend to be using pieces of it but uh, and that's the reason I did all this as a website, because teachers go to my website usually going around the curriculum rather than through a curriculum, because the curriculum will usually be some kind of textbook, which is okay, motivating themes and exercises, stuff to do, which is not going to hurt anybody, but it's not going to be complete and uh, thorough the way this computational stuff is. So. I basically, I'm kind of like Donald Trump. He goes directly to the American people with his Twitter account. Or I go straight to teachers with my website, and, and they, they use it. But there are very few programs that have implemented it 100%. And one, one of the things that's interesting is I'm going to Israel in March to talk for a month, and they are going to implement it. They have very successful ESL. And... And they're ready to uh, sort of go with this frequency thing. And they've developed their own lists based on their own needs and students and, and uh, their own. So I, I'm, I'm bringing the software, and they're going to tell me what to put in it. And, uh, but there are very few places that have actually done this in any degree of thoroughness. So research talks about it, but not many places do it. It would be interesting to um, to follow up and see what happens after your visit in Israel. So we'll we'll be uh, keeping the electronic tabs on you. No, I'm just making a joke there. But uh, yeah, that would be interesting. I'll come back and talk to you guys again in one year's time.
Okay, we'll sign you up right now. We'll take we'll take your word for that. Yeah, no, that that'll be excellent. Um, your uh, your fact about independent when does a learner become independent is really interesting because um, we are challenged with the individualized learning format in our ESL classes. So you can have yeah. students at any course in English. Some of, some of the teachers in the province actually have ESL plus they teach other subjects as well. So there's a a lot of juggling around and I, I can imagine how many teachers would just love it when that student gets to that independent level. So this is a uh, new question that just came to my mind. I'm kind of thinking out loud here for uh, maybe other teachers that are thinking the same thing, which is I'd be really curious to know for our level program, we have pre-secondary to secondary five, when we would expect a student to uh, to obtain this kind of 3,000 most common word level. I'm not expecting a, a concrete answer for that, but it's just something I'm throwing out there. And maybe as we see your tools and your analyses and, and the little pilot project that we did, maybe it'll give us an indicator of what level we think that might be at. Um, speaking of um, kind of the most common word vocabulary or everyday vocabulary, in our program, we do a lot of uh, learning learning activities called learning situations. In addition to um, you know grammar practice and spelling practice and writing practice and you know those kind of discrete skills, uh, learning situations are kind of a contextual scenario, almost like problem-based learning, where they have to accomplish some kind of task that they could encounter in real life because we're in adult ed, uh, using a variety of texts and Depending on where you are, they might be texts from a textbook, they might be authentic texts um, taken from the internet or adapted from the internet. Uh, so we deal with a lot of theme related vocabulary or subject specific vocabulary. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what's what's the role of theme related vocabulary compared to like uh, the the most common word vocabulary that students should know? Yeah, well themes are great and interesting and motivating. It, the only problem is that they tend to have their own specialized vocabulary such that, you know, if it's about something in medicine, there's going to be words that you will not see in the next one, which is about, you know, um, mud wrestling or something. So uh, you end up with a lot of vocabulary that people will not see enough. Research is pretty clear that if you don't see a word ten times, you uh, don't have much chance to learn it. So, so with theme-based, it's high on motivation, and it's interesting for the teacher and uh, colorful. And but the vocab, what you have to do is use software to find the common vocabulary that is in there. So, for example, um, if you have fourteen themes like those ones you sent me, you will find that there's a lot of vocabulary that is only in one of the uh, themes. So they're going to see it in, in September and not see it again. So you can't really say that they learned that. So what you have to do is use software that pulls out the number of themes that a particular word appears in. So if it's, um, you know, usually words like love and friend and things like that will be across the set of themes. So software can pull out the common vocab. Some of it will be too simple, so you can use the software to find the vocab which is not simple, but which has occurred in say more than, you know, if you have 10 themes and more than five. And then that's kind of your vocab syllabus in a theme-based course. Okay. Um, I wanted to know what the percentage of words they should know in 1K, 2K, and like the first and second thousand words, and yeah. same for secondary four and five. Okay, well they should know 95% of the words in the text they have to read. So if you take uh, Montreal Gazette as a, an example of what you would like them to read, then they have to be able to know 95% of the words in a typical Montreal Gazette, you know, article. 
And this uh, would be typically um, all of the first thousand and all of the second thousand and most of the third thousand. So 2,500 is pretty much basic. Now, it doesn't mean they have to know every word in the first thousand or the second thousand, but probably at least 90% of each of those levels so that they add up to 95% coverage in, in the type of text that you want them to read. You see what I'm trying to say? So it's 90% of each level, which should add up to 95% of the words on the page. However, there are a couple of uh, nuances there. And one is that you don't really need to teach proper nouns. Proper nouns in a, in a story, that's not lexical. That's just part of the topic. So if it's about, you know, Justin Trudeau, you, the software is able to ignore proper nouns if you wanted to. Because those aren't something you would teach in a language class. They probably know it anyway. So there are some little things like that, and and also the treatment of compound nouns, which are, are going to be a bit special. But it's essentially 2,500 words by frequency. And then they should have enough basis to get the others in a theme or whatever else they're trying to do at work or something. They should be able to get it from context when they have 95 to 98%. I have a question. Um, the golden rule that I learned for ESL teaching is K plus one. Um, I think it was Janet or Manuel said L plus one, uh, meaning that you at the student's level, yeah. you teach one level up, uh, yeah. kind of like a, a challenge to, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not really sure why, but that's the rule. So your 95% coverage, like the 95% words of the text they should know, is that at the level or is that the K plus one level? 95 yes. is uh, is sort of K minus 1. 98 is, is K. Not the text is a bit too challenging. If they know 90% uh, the text is a bit too challenging. If they know 95% uh, it, it's possible. They can make inferences. If they could use a dictionary they probably be well served. And 98 is at the point where independent reading takes place. I can show you lots of really good research, not just by me, that shows this very clearly. That so so 90 and below is impossible. They will get the topic, but not the actual, you know, hypothèse. And 95 they can cope with, so it's a learning text. 98 is a text they can comprehend and and which we they can use to build fluency. Okay. That's, that's, so that's, that's Krashen's K scheme, but Krashen never specified what his thing meant. His was all intuitive, because he was a non-numbers guy. But so what, what vocab, studies have done is broken this into actual numbers that can be used by anybody with, you know, basic software skills. So that's just one of the examples of when I said I could listen to you all afternoon. Like that's uh, really, the numbers bring it home. Um, Mano, cover your ears. I'm going to ask an exam question. Now I'm, I'm, I'm kidding about the cover your ears. It's not a specific question. But for teachers or uh, education consultants that are uh, devising exams, like uh, we have the new optional courses coming up. So I'm wondering, when we select texts for these kinds of exams, or even our um, practice evaluation situations, so practice exams for our students, do we want to aim for the K plus one, the K, definitely not the K minus one. So a summative evaluation and of course, outcomes that we're evaluating. Where do we want to? Where do we want to aim when we're choosing our texts? I think there should be some texts at each level. 
there should be some texts that are at the student's level, some a little beyond it, and some quite far beyond it. Because coping with a text that is too difficult for you is, I mean, it's a skill that you have to have. You know, if I were to suddenly start, you know, a PhD in French language, I would have to work really hard with difficult texts. And I would expect it. I'd, I'd be on my dictionary, clicking on my dictionary uh, every minute. So, I mean, that is a skill, which they should be able to cope with to some extent. But there should be one at their level, one a little beyond. And the one that's a little beyond is where you'd give them practice in inference or a test of inference, where there's maybe three new words or five, but enough context of words that they do know, usually 95%, that it is possible to make inferences. And then 98, just because you would have practiced and, and they have practiced anyway in dealing with difficult texts. But it should not just be all difficult texts. And another thing that supports what I'm saying is that in Quebec, you hardly ever get a homogenous classroom. You always get somebody who knows a lot, somebody who knows almost nothing. So you have to give everybody something I can do, even on the test. And so that also that, that theory also covers, you know, it's challenging for some, and but and yet there's something there for, that everybody can do. So it's, it's almost like a like a form of differentiation, if if I'm not yeah. uh, confusing the two concepts. Okay. Anyway, uh, that, uh, that's that's definitely. But there should but there should be uh, in, there should be words they've never seen before. But in a 95% context, that's the uh, K plus one. And there should be some maybe longer texts that if they have achieved fluency at the K level, then they can get through it and answer questions. Questions like opinion versus facts and, um, you know, uh, referencing issues and, and stuff like that. Anyway, if you send me a test, if you send me a test, an old test sometime, I can quite quickly tell you how it would fit in with stuff that my research is about. I would be happy to, and I'd be anxious to know the results. Yeah, and and also if I knew the the vocab levels of the students, well, sort of like what you sent me already. But if I had also a test that goes with that, then I could um, I could very I, th I could put together, I think, a, an interesting page on how that test fits in with those students and what they have been taught. Now, jokingly, I'm saying that that would be perfect for that webinar you committed to for next year already. Well, can be at the end of the summer or any time. I, I don't mind. Excellent. Thank you very much for your generous offer and for your time today. We are uh, really grateful. Um, so you mentioned the length of the text. I'm very curious. Um, within our program, it, we, we, we have word limits, but you, like exams excluded, you can kind of play around with it. Are there any, any advantages or disadvantages to a very long text at 95% versus a short text at 98. Are there any implications of the choice of length plus difficulty? Well, there should be, I mean, if, if the students, uh, suppose that you can find a text that is mostly 1,000, that's 95% or 98%, 1,000 level. You can. In these uh, graded readers, it's, it's quite easy to find. And so if they actually know 1,000 words, if that was the goal of the course, and they had their flashcards or their lists or their software or their book or whatever to get up to that level, then they should be able to deal with quite a long text, which is at that level. And, it, and, they, and they also need to be taught the strategy of don't just stop the minute you find something difficult, carry on. <laughs> If they can see that it's a three-page text and they have to get to the end of it, and they only have one hour for the test or something, they, they you know, they have to have that strategy. And then, but they're, but then, so a longer text at their level, and then a shorter text which they have to actually work with, make inferences, um, 
uh, dig out uh, meaning from. So that should be a shorter text, I don't know, half page. So a longer text of the stuff they actually should know, and a shorter text where it's at their plus one level, i.e. their 95% known words. Okay. But there should also be a vocab test on, on every test as far as I'm concerned. Every reading test should also have a vocab test. But not one that takes half an hour, but just one that they can quickly do. Well, that's something um, uh, later on when we get a tour of your website, that's something that uh, I was wondering for us to ask about your vocab test that you do have in the, on the website, as well as uh, where teachers can get the word lists to make their own if, if they feel yeah. so inclined. Uh, yes. But before we get into that, you were saying um, short text, long text, and uh, being able to work with them in different ways. Uh, that goes kind of along with those uh, four strands I was asking you about before the webinar. Uh, the fact that teaching, uh, kind of the general rule of teaching time for a second language would be 25% um, on discrete elements, how much on fluency, how much on pronunciation. Could you just kind of explain that, that one a little bit? Yeah, well, this is an idea by this uh, same guy that sort of uh, was my hero when I was doing my PhD. His name is Paul Nation, and he's written lots of books. They're all on his website, and the website is linked from my website. But he's got one called The Four Strands, and, and, and in that he argues that, uh, I forget exactly what the four strands are. I've used this for years at UCAM with um, ESL trainee teachers, but uh, definitely one was... Um, fluency building, and which is practice with stuff that you find quite easy, like work, texts at your level. So you should always be reading something at your level, whether it says homework or, and but it could not just be reading; it could also be writing. People should always be writing a journal, you know, or what they think about uh, anything. In Hong Kong, I was always sitting on this ferry boat reading my students' journals. It wasn't to correct everything, it was just to read it and make one little sentence remark at the end to show that I was interested and that I read it. So that kind of within level fluency should be 25% of the course. Another 25% should be language focused, whether it's grammar or vocab, but not just one or the other. And I have to, hate to tell you, but I forget the other two. But, but I think one of them is production, and the other, and, and the fourth one is um, is for building up uh, access. But I, I didn't pre really prepare that, and haven't looked at it for a long time. But for this particular uh, job, it's that focus on language, including vocab, should be 25% of any, of any course. Everybody, sh everybody should have a look at that book because it is highly readable and extremely interesting. And uh, Nation's just uh, a fountain of good sense. I, I, uh, I remember reading that book when I first started teaching ESL because, quite frankly, I, I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I remember, like, okay the meanings, uh, the descriptions were clear enough for me to jump in and it shaped my uh, my classroom practice considerably. So uh, I saw a drastic improvement in the way, the, the activities that I chose to help students produce, both in, in writing and speaking. So uh, yeah, it, it was helpful. So What I get from the four strands is basically that there shouldn't be only language focus, because that's what it used to be. I, I mean. And a language course is all language focus. When I did French in school, it was all language focus. Almost zero meaning focus, even though we did read Jean Valjean and stuff, but it was just mainly about language. But then later it became almost always about meaning and no language focus. So anyway, the point I get from the four strands is that it's both, and every course has to have both. But anyway, four things. But those are those are the two that I focus on. Go. I'm going to ask Professor Cobb if we would start with the little mini pilot project we did, so that he can walk us through the process.
um, what it means, and then the tools he used and his website, and we'll, we'll start getting into the technical part. So uh, what we asked or Dr. Cobb to do, or maybe it was your idea, I don't mean to take credit for it, but we thought it'd be kind of cool if we did a, a real life pilot, little mini pilot project. So we got a few teachers on board. Um, he has a vocab test on his website. There's several, but he guided us to a particular one. We had our students do the vocabulary test and we sent the results to Professor Cobb. Also, what we did was we put together a corpus. So a corpus is, is just a word that means a collection of learning materials that you would use for a particular level or grade or whatnot. Uh, we chose A and G 5101 and we took uh, some uh, a, a few selections from a few textbooks that are available for that course, a few learning situations created by teachers. Uh, don't panic. I, um, we asked the permission of the teachers that created them, so I, we, we don't want to make anyone feel on the spot. So if you weren't contacted for permission, don't worry, your, your material hasn't been included. Uh, it didn't get analyzed. If you want to have it analyzed later, um, by all means, just follow the steps that Professor Cobb will show us, and uh, you can analyze it yourself. And we took um, some other documents, all of the kinds of things you would need in the course, put it together, that makes up the corpus, and he ran his analysis tool on it to see the frequency of the common words coming up versus theme related vocabulary. As we all know, examining issues, a lot of our activities have a specific theme um, related to them. So uh, if you're ready, Professor Cobb, if you would lead us through the process of um, uh, what we did. After we got our students to do the vocab test on the computer, they clicked send. We sent the results to you. Mm -hmm. And if you could explain what all of those numbers mean, because my students ask me, like, what does this mean? I don't know. I have to ask Professor Cobb. Oh, OK. OK, well, I'm sorry about all these colors. Um, I, I made these with a group of Chinese students several years ago. And these are the colors they wanted. And uh, so I've kind of left it that way. So uh, this is a kind of worksheet that I have made, which you can get easily just by typing in fga.html. So this is the website, lextutor.ca, or www.lextutor.ca. And if you go here and just type in fga.html, like that. Anyway, you don't need to do this right now. It's just that these are the links that I will talk about. And I, I know that when I'm jumping around from thing to thing on this big website that nobody can follow it. So these are the links that I will use. So th this is the backgrounder here. These are things I will talk about in sort of my general short course on uh, you know text analysis. And over here is some of the stuff that Lori sent me, the, the mini uh, so what I did with it and uh, the software that I used to analyze it. Okay, so first I'm going to get the scores. Okay, so these, this is what Laurie uh, sent me. These are all the scores, the raw scores. So some of them have names, some of them don't. Here's Laurie's score herself and Laurie did quite well on this test. Um, the, the way it works is the program, the student takes a test. Uh, let me show you what the test looks like. The test looks uh, like this. So these are the tests that students can take. This one was called the vocabulary size test. And so it's just arranged by first thousand by frequency. And there's a word. And then they have to choose the meaning for that word as it appears in this sentence. So there's the first thousand and the second thousand. So this is made to go on a phone, so it's not really, uh, I, well, I can actually spread it out so that you can see what it is. So there's the 14,000, 13,000. So there are 14,000 levels. And uh, so we start at the first thousand, and it's just by frequency. So these are the most common words of the language, like C, 
and drive and time and jump, which have been randomly chosen from uh, from uh, the corpus, which I'll talk about in another order later. Okay, so back to these scores. Uh, the student takes that test and finishes it, clicks, you know, finished, and uh, out come the scores, and it's it it uh, the computer tracks the date and time so that the teacher can go to this data file and pick out the scores. And the IP number, if they have a, a lab or a students working at home or whatever, so they can find out who it is in case they don't enter a name. But usually the teacher can just use the date to get their scores off here. And so this is the score at 1K in the first thousand, the second thousand, the third thousand. So as you can see, some people were not able to actually use the test. And there's always something goes wrong when people use software, so that's normal. And there are several tests there, so it's good to use uh, the one that you don't want first because students need to learn how to do it. They're all in the same format. But anyway, eventually you get somebody down here who has a score of 90 at the first thousand, 90 at the second thousand, 100 at the third thousand, and so on. And when we get down to Lori, you see that she's got 100 at the first thousand. So obviously Lori is a native speaker. You guys would get the same, I'm sure. And even uh, anybody will make some mistakes because, uh, you know, you click the wrong thing or whatever. So I sorted this into a clean copy for uh, students only with scores, because some didn't have a score. And then I divided this into three groups. So we have basically three groups, strong, medium, and weak. So the way this works is 1K, 2K, 3K, and so on, all the way to 14K. And you see that this first person has got a good score all the way to 14K. So then the program calculates the size of their vocabulary, which in this case is 10,800 word families. And then it proposes the level that they should work at. In this, in this case, it's level 7 because level 7 was the first level back here where the person got less than, than uh, 80. So take 80 as the cutoff. And then it the seconds they took. So 1,300 seconds to divided by 60. Yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah. So the person took 20 minutes for this test. Okay, so that's the strong. So I don't know, Lori, if these are all people who were uh, in uh, your class or their other teachers because he has got a very good score. And if he's in, uh, you know, a secondary class, he's, he's kind of challenging to deal with until he gets, uh, although here's 4K where his learning uh, could start, except he's back to 100 again here. So that's a bit of a fluke. Anyway, medium. And then weak. Here is the typical situation that I have found when I've done research in schools, particularly outside Montreal. So at 1K, 30 and 70 and 50 and 60. Now, when you consider that 1K is at least 70% of any text, and this person has got 30% of that, that means that they've got very low uh, coverage, that the knowledge they have is not going to do much for them in reading a text. And then at 2K, it's kind of the same. And then interestingly, at 4K, he's got more. So there's 1K at 30%, and 4K at 40%, and 5K at 60%. So that's interesting. This person has got more knowledge at the less frequent places than in the most frequent places. But like I said, this is sometimes because you have uh, more Greco-Latin words that are familiar from French, and here you have more Anglo-Saxon words that are not familiar from French. Anyhow, this is the typical situation of uh, learners outside of Montreal, but with some of these guys mixed in always. So always a mixed ability class. And so if we go down to the end here, we can see that these people, they know lots of words. They have 2,000 and even 3,000 words of vocabulary 
this person has less, but that it's not where it's needed. It's not here and here. And this is where, as we said earlier, 80% of English is piled up. So they have lots of vocabulary, it's just not at the right place. And so that's the challenge to get it to be there. And here's the time they took. So from that, you can just see that nobody just uh, clicked their way through and finished in you know a few seconds. And, and nobody had a score of, uh, so I mean, they all had taken it seriously. So that's basically what you get from that. OK, any questions about the test scores? Does that surprise you, Lori? Well, no, um, it doesn't. But I will say, I think for some, the reason they scored higher in some levels than lower, it could be the cognates, the, the Greco-Latin, yeah. French similarity. Some of them, um, a variety of strategies to guess, and they guessed correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, students that scored high did not surprise me at all. Um, they are just people that grew up with the English English speaking friends or an English parent, one or the other. So it's no surprise they scored high. Right. Uh, we gave them a max of an hour to try the test just to to kind of give some parameters there. I would say overall the scores don't surprise me. Yeah. I would just say that if, if you use this kind of test again, it's, there, there are several of this kind of test, and I, I showed you those on the, uh, well, on the, these are the things that work on a phone. So this here called levels tests, and uh, that's this one. So just use one of the other ones to make sure they know how it works, because they all have the same format, and, uh, you know, they, they put a number into the place, and uh, and it works that way. So then you won't get those zero scores. Anyway, the software is probably not perfect either because it was all those, we lost all those nice scores and uh, here because when they clicked it, this all went away. But probably the software wasn't clear or something like that. Anyway, but Lori, any, any more about the tests? Well, I, I found that I, I did the test myself in class. I partially finished, tried it at home uh, three times, but misclicked, lost my data. But I found the, some of the words in the higher levels interesting yeah. that they really are um, common words like erythrocyte, because myself, I probably never would have known what that was if I hadn't taken the university physiology. Do, yeah. do the higher levels have some words in there or is it strictly common words? It's a general corpus but it's uh, it, it just has words that we, you know here are words like ubiquitous and talon and ruble and it's just taken by random out of that particular frequency uh, area I mean but some of them are going to be very common to affect francophone like didactic uh, communique um, um, well, talon, except that it's it's not the same in English, but it's pretty similar. And so they can get quite a bit uh, from cognates, from congénère, reptile over here, and uh, so on. Anyway. For, for, uh, no, for teachers that are watching this webinar and that are interested in doing the test, I, I, I think it would be, let me rephrase that. I, I coached my students before they took the test and showed them that there are 14 levels and to not feel bad if they don't get those 12th, 13th yeah. and, and levels and so on. Some of them they told me after that they just felt horrible and I said, well, no, I, you have to consider that it gets increasingly difficult and if you can get up to, you know, K6 or 7 the or even the 8th level and you can answer some of the questions like so I tried to kind of set the expectation that it, it would be unlikely that they would be able to score everything um, to, so that they wouldn't come out feeling distraught and once we had gone through that little explanation most of them were really agreeable happy to do it and uh, it'll be nice to show them the results now that I'm learning how to interpret them it'll be nice to go over that with them and and make a plan 
Okay, well, a, a thing you can do if you want, okay, so it's, if, if you're not working on a phone, I mean, the phone is obviously kind of an offshoot of the program. But this is where the test is on the actual website, lextutor.ca slash tests. And it's called, this is called the vocabulary size test because it's, you know, the most common one. And these are the results as they come out. And you can see that people are using it actually today. And, uh, you know, so uh, it just comes out like that. So if a teacher uses it, they just have to find out where theirs are and uh, copy them and then save the file as an Excel sheet and it comes out, you know, uh, kind of okay. But for your students, there's the test as a test, but there's also the test as practice. So if, you, if, if your students want to use the test as a learning tool, not a testing tool, and of course that's your decision because once they've used it as a practice tool, then they cannot use it anymore as a testing tool because it's they know it already for other reasons. But this is uh, the, the mode equals practice from the same test. So they can get mode equals practice and go test mode and then back to practice to some extent. So here, for example, they saw it, they looked at it, he drives fast, uses a car, they have a lot of time, so that's hours, tried to jump, get off the ground. So I should have four there, and each level has uh, 10, so I should get 40 at the first level. So when I click here, you see, there's K01, I got 4 out of 10, and I got 40%. So that means I can keep on using this, and, and down here is the diagnostic, so their vocab size is 400 words, and they, their work should be at, at the first K, K01, because that's where they got a low score. And they can just carry on and correct their mistakes. So for example, if uh, they, they can just they can do it in four questions at a time or one question at a time. So it was difficult period, difficult time, and click it again, and they'll go up to 50, and they can do the whole test that way if they want to, and then go back and do it as test mode. Because if you do it as test mode, you don't get a chance to, you don't want to click here, are you sure you want to submit your test for a recorded score? And you can go back and, uh, Yes. How do we how do we interpret the results? So let's say I have a student who comes in in secondary three. It's his first day, and I want to do a vocab test just to have an idea of yeah. where he's at. Um, let's say he does uh, the first four thousand words. Um, how do I yeah. interpret the results? What should he be at in the first thousand, second thousand, third, and fourth thousand? Okay, well, um, like, like I showed you on that uh, Excel, okay, let me get that Excel thing again. Okay, those are the test scores. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, I'm going to show you some, okay, so there's the first K, he's got 30%. And the second K, he's got 30%. So if you consider that the first 2,000 words by frequency are 80% of an average text, then this person has got 30% of 80%, then he's got next to nothing in any text yeah. that he's going to read. So they should have, I mean, up here, here's this guy. He's got 1K, 100, 2K, 100, 3K, 100, 4K, 70, and even 5K, 100. So he is in great shape. Uh, he's probably from an English family or whatever, so so he's he's kind of lucky. But this would be a typical place where your learner will be. Can you see? Um, so at the first K, he's got 80. At the second K, he's got 60. But then at the third K, he's got 90. So that third K isn't helping him all that much because the third K is not that important. It's not present in texts to any degree. It's going to only be 5% or less of, a, of, a, of any typical text. But these two here are 1K and 2K are 80%. So this person has got sort of, say, an average of 70% of the zone that is 80%. So he's going to have about 56 or 
of the words known in any given text. So anyway, that's how I can answer this question right now. But can you remember that question it and I'll go back get back to it uh, later because I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff that will uh, that will will make this plain what this all is and where it comes from. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks. That's Manon. Okay, so I'm going to go back to, okay, this is, uh, okay, that's that test. And like I said, there are other tests of this type. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, okay, now Lori also sent me a corpus. So I'm going to go to that now. Is that okay, Lori? Absolutely. Okay, so Lori sent me all these files, and um, she sent me them uh, as Word documents in, a, in this folder. So those are all Word documents and, you know, with big, long titles. So the first thing I have to do is um, transform all of those to short titles, and they should be not docx, but they should be .txt files. So it's a simple thing to take uh, any Word file, open it, resave it as a text file. So once I did all that, then I have that same corpus as text, so and with short names. So those were the 14 texts that I uh, took from Lori. And uh, they're text files, which means that if you open them up, you don't see a bunch of formatting, like in a Word file, with fonts and bold and stuff like that. All you see is just the raw words. And that's what software needs to process text. So um, then what I do is, uh, so I'm looking for the vocabulary level of those texts. So here I have uh, a file which I have made using a program called Corpus Builder, which takes all of these texts and makes them into a combined file. Okay. So with that, I can, I can throw out the names of the files because I don't really need that to be in here and all that stuff from the menu and everything else. So it's just that and resave it. So that is now the file, which is 7,000, about seven, just over 7,000 words. And I can now take that and do something quite interesting with it. I can take all that and copy it into memory, so control C, and I can go to a program called Vocab Profile, which is on your uh, thing, and paste that entire corpus in there. So there is your corpus with camouflage pants and all that kind of stuff. I just give it a name. So I've called this Mel's 2020 because I wasn't sure what else to call it. And then uh, I choose some settings and so on, but you don't have to worry about that right now. And submit it as a text. Okay, so it's going to take a little while because it's, you know, 8,000 words. And it's going to go and match every word in that text against... Um, the set of frequency lists that live inside this program. And the framework I am, yeah, okay, so uh, I'm going to come back to this in baby steps, but this is just right now to deal with uh, your text. So the first thing that comes out of there is all the proper nouns, words like, so there are 28 cases of Canada. So I've had the program take away the proper nouns, names of countries, Names of people like Simar down here and so on. I can't seem to get it to click only twice. So then here comes the analysis. The analysis of this corpus is that the first thousand words are 82% in this corpus. The second thousand, cum so the second thousand is another 99.5. So cumulatively, it's 91, and the third thousand give us 95. In other words, the 95% zone in this corpus comes with 3,000 words. 
So that means it's a pretty difficult, pretty difficult text. And then as we go through with K4, another 1%. K5, another 0.6%. K6, another 0.4%. And only when we have K6 do we get 98%. In other words, a learner would need 3,000 words to read this at 95%. And 95% is the level at which they are at um, I plus 1. In other words, it's just beyond their level. And 98, which is their I, in other words, where they can comprehend it, they would need 6,000 words to read this text. In other words, to read it with fluency, not, look, not looking up very many words, and so on. And then there's all these levels down here that are almost 0%. Anyway, they're still there. So that is your corpus as it breaks down. And then we go down even further. That is what it looks like with all the blue words as 1K, first thousand, plus it has taken proper nouns like Montreal and made them also into 1K. And then other colors are from different levels. So green is from the second thousand and yellow is from the third thousand, and so on. So you can see there are lots of colors. And then the words at the end, like download, which are in red, those means that, that means that those are usually compounds that are off the scheme. In other words, the, the program doesn't know those words because compound words can be made up by anybody, and they're not, you know, I mean, they're in the dictionary, but uh, there, there are too many of them to include in a scheme like this. So then as you go down and down and down and down, okay, so this is kind of a big corpus. Then you get down to, those are all the first thousand level words. Those are all the second thousand level words. And then the third thousand level words. And then the fours. And then the fives. And then the sixes. And then the sevens. And so the thing you can see is that there are a lot of different words in this text. So, and the, here's what's interesting. Look at these little numbers that come after. Abroad is in one time. Achievement is in one time. Addiction is in two times. Adequately is in once. So all these words that are actually quite difficult and quite lower frequency are only in once. In other words, they're going to see a word like albeit, and it's in there once, or wary, and it's in there once. No, in other words, it's not in there so that you could learn it, because it's only going to be in one text and then never seen again. Okay, so does that give you any insight into those texts, Lori? I, I, I really like that um, it inventories the uh, each word and which category it belongs to on the bottom um, so that when you want to look back at your text you can see and I, I love the fact that it shows how frequently each word shows up as well so if you're thinking of modifying something uh, yeah. it, it shows you how often and um, like how important it is and maybe if you can swap that word out with something a, a little bit simpler to understand um, I find that really Useful. As I'm looking at your list, there are some fairly advanced words further down. Um, yeah. So it, it kind of confirms for some of the texts that I've, I've used in class uh, that they're advanced. And what our students do, mine, some of mine, they get hung up on those words. And when we work with reading strategies, we want to teach them how to deal with those. You might even call them outliers because, like you said, they show up so infrequently. Yeah. Is it really worth the effort? To spend that 20 minutes trying to figure out that one word when you could just focus on the general uh, meaning. So um, there's a lot to consider and, and these uh, color codings and, and the data really help to clarify what's what in your text. It's uh, quite another, amazing. Another thing that you maybe haven't noticed is uh, this this part of the program, you know, it goes down and down and scrolling and scrolling. But, uh, that's because it's grown over the years. And different people have used it for different research projects. And 
PhDs and everything else, and it's it's so, it's kind of confusing. It's all here, but this part is called edit to a profile. Okay, so we see over here, Montreal Police don camouflage pants. Uh, protest meets comfort. The government of the province of Quebec has introduced legislation. Okay, look at introduced legislation. That's a second thousand and a third thousand word. Okay, so over here, I can change this. Introduced legislation. I can say made a new law. Somehow it's got a capital. Anyway, won't make made a new law, uh, and then down here another one, public employee pension funds. Okay, so let's call it um, pension money. I don't maybe that's uh, changing the meaning, but anyway, just to make the point, to make it an equitable. Here we have equitable. So over here it's the same tech. Make it. Uh, so take out equitable and fair. Make it a fair system with 50% of the funds. I call this money. Okay, so I can change this to quite a bit uh, simpler language. Now look over here before at the profile. It was 82.1 for first thousand. If I click revp then it's going to change everything to those simpler words that I traded it for. So we have to wait again because it's big. It's bigger than the typical text would be for this purpose. Okay, and then go down to that same place again. And you see, it's not 82.1 anymore. It's now 82.2, which is first thousand. So if you do this for about an hour, you can just raise the K1 level and lower the K2 level until K1 is uh, more uh, is is most of the text. Now this would clearly be quite difficult in a text of 7,000 words. It would take you a whole weekend, but in one text you can do it quite easily to make it a text which is more at your student's level. And um, up here, suppose you want to find out. Okay, so um, suppose I want to say money. Is that a, 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 a high frequency word? And I can just stick it in there and click this button, and it'll tell me that it's a K1 word. It's in two schemes, but anyway, this is the one that I typically use. So then I know that if I put money in there instead of funds, I'm taking a 3,000 level word and changing that to a 1,000 level word and then making this into more of a blue text and less of a less of a multicolored text which means that the students should be able to uh, to get it is that okay and also i have a thesaurus here so if you can't think of a word to replace it with you can get so for funds capital money assets wherewithal means and so on so obviously money is probably the easiest one so it makes it easy for people to edit the text either down usually down but also to let raise it up a level uh, if that's what's needed so that's basically your text I'd like to show you one more thing about your text um, and that is the uh, there's a program here called Range, which will tell you the number of texts that your, uh, whoops, not that one, this one, Range for User Texts. So it will tell you the number of your 14, for each word, the number of texts that it appears in. Because some of the words appear fairly frequently, but do they appear in more than one text? So here I'm going to choose uh, 14. Okay, so that means I now have 14 spaces that I can upload a text. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry this is a bit boring, but I'm going to have to put these in here one at a time. So that means we will we will get this 
It'll be like vocab profile that we saw a minute ago, except it'll be for separate texts. Don't you love watching somebody fool around with his, with his computer? I've, I've looked for some cheaper or less time consuming way to do this, but I can't find it. This is where you've got to remember which one you put in last time, not make too many mistakes. Uh, importance of English, Muhammad Yunus. Do any of you recognize any of these? A music couple, and you may not remember them because I've given them short names as uh, as I mentioned. Um, I was polling. I was commenting. We appreciate the demonstration, so that if we want to try this ourselves, uh, yeah. we know that we have to upload uh, manually. So I mean, no, I'm, I'm going click click like crazy and everything, but. Uh, that you may have to do some searching and stuff, but that that sheet that I gave you in the first place, everything that's uh, that that I'm doing is on there. Okay, maybe I might miss one. Uh, no, I guess I'm getting them all. Okay, so almost almost done. I have to scroll now. Okay, so then not the last one because that one is the combined file. These are the separate files. Women and boat. No, not women and boat. It's the next one. Your clothes. Okay, those are fun texts, by the way. Okay, so I'm going to ask for families, and uh, I'm going to give it a name. I'll give it Mel's 2020, like I did before. And once I do that, I can click Submit Files. And it will quickly go and make a big, huge list of all the words that are in this file, but by families. So this, for example, is the family of B, right? So that'll be is, and am, and was, and so on. OK. So uh, I need to put it down a size. OK, so this column here is the frequency. So you can see that there's a lot of examples of the word B, obviously. But this is the range. Now, the range means the number of texts. So B is in all 14. There were 14 texts. It's there in all 14 of them. And this is the BNC COCA level. In other words, the frequency level, which is 1, because it's a very high frequency word. OK, so you, these are the words that are in all 14 texts. And as I go, so I'm going to sort. If I click on this button up here, it sorts by range. Okay, so now I can I can show you the number of words that are in all 14. See, and it's only the first 10 that are in all 14. And then these are the words that are in 13 of the texts, but they're just prepositions and words like by and things. And then 12, and then 11, and 9. And see, and we're still just in pronouns and stuff. And so by the time we get to content words like child, we are in only seven of the texts. So seven of the texts contain child. So as I go down, these are the ones that are in six of the texts. So words like school, words like govern, words like family, words like better, become, and important. And then the fives, remember we're looking at this column. And so finally we get down to the fours. And then the vast majority of the words are in this one time only. So those are the ones that are in two texts. So, OK, given that there are 1,299 families, fewer, more, about half of them, like this, are in one uh, of those texts only. So all of these are in one text only. So there's no reason to expect that anybody has learned ballot, uh, baseball uh, behavior. Of course, they might know it already, but they won't learn it here because it's only in one time. So 
Previously, somebody asked me the question in the theme-based uh, course, what is the vocabulary? And so I would say that in this case, the word, the content words, not the prepositions and pronouns and things, that are in seven down to four of the texts are possible words that they should know. So there's about maybe a hundred words in here, words like increase, words like remove, words like according, words like weather. That would be the core vocabulary for this corpus that they probably don't know because they're not all that frequent and yet they have seen enough times and if they see them also in some other way like in a vocabulary course or in flashcards or something this is what it's possible that they would have learned and notice that these are largely 1k words so that if I check, check on this button for the frequency level okay so you have some that are quite low frequency, like Aborigine, Bamboo, Clad, Contrived, that are level 7, 6, 5. So there's a lot of very infrequent words that are just in one of those texts. Level 5, level 4. So I'm, in, I'm looking at this column and comparing it to this column. Level 4, and it's only in one text. Level 4, only in one text. Of course, you can take out the uh, cognates, the congenere, but still, if they are words like uh, trousers, it's not a congenere, it's a level four, and it's only in one text, one of those uh, pieces. So, you know, they're not going to learn it. And, uh, okay, so I think range is a really useful thing to, uh, to, uh, use for uh, a theme-based course is you can see very very clearly what's uh, what's not going to be uh, possible and another piece of software that you can use in a theme-based course and it's not on your list I'm just going there now the amount of vocab they have in common so, for example, here is a, court, a, a text called Canadian Politics, and here is a, a text called uh, Canadian Business, and these are unrelated topics and different authors. And when I submit it, I get a big list of the words that are unique to one text and unique to the second text, and then the words in the middle that are shared. So. As you can see, there are not many in the middle that are shared between those two texts because they are more or less on different topics. And when I go back to this, which is same topic, same author, so this is a story, chapter one, this is the same story, chapter two, and submit it. Okay, same thing again, the vocabulary that is unique to the old is here, unique to the new, and here's the shared. But look at the amount of shared. If I scroll and scroll and scroll, there's lots of shared vocabulary. And then if I do the final step, go to simplified vocabulary for the same stories, chapter one and chapter two. Okay, so now the middle one is shared. And look how many are shared right across. All of that is shared. And what is unique to the new one is not that much. So what I am saying here is that the relevance of this to a theme-based topic is that you can use this software to decide for the little repetition that there is in those texts what the correct sequence of those texts would be. Because the ideal would be to have the maximum amount of shared vocabulary between the two. So this is a way that you could decide that camouflage pants should come before Muhammad Yunus or whatever because they, should, they have more shared vocabulary. So I'm saying that these are ways that can be used to, uh, to um, 
to organize a theme-based uh, syllabus. Is that okay? That's fabulous. No, okay, so I think I should go back to um, my worksheet and uh, go through some of the background of some of this. Is that a good idea or is it or not? Absolutely. Okay, so and the reason it's interesting is that you can do this yourselves with fga.html. So these are the links. So I start off with what is a corpus? This is the backgrounder. So I've I've done this part now more or less. I didn't. I showed you range. I showed you. I'll, I'll show you more from here. But this is the backgrounder. So where do these lists come from? Well, they come from a corpus. So what is a corpus? How do we get from a corpus to a frequency list? How do we get from a list to a family list? In other words, with all the members. How do we get from a family from a family list to a K list? How do we get from a list to a test? And how do we get from a list to a profile? And how do we uh, relate tests and profiles? Seem okay? Yeah. So first thing is, what is a corpus? So if you click on any of these links, you can use your back arrow to get back to this page. If, if this grabs you and you want to look at it in detail and ask me questions or uh, et cetera. Okay, so this is a concordancer where you type in a word. You choose whether it's going to be a single word or the whole family of that word, like plurals, the adjective form, and so on. You choose a corpus over here. There's all of these corpora that have been made by different people. I'm going to choose one which is made in Britain by Coventry University, and they run this on my website. And I'm going to choose to sort it by the subcorpus. Okay, so this corpus is um, 8 million words. And it's not just any 8 million words. It's words from agriculture, words from architecture, words from literature, linguistics, many, many different fields. And it will show you this particular word as it appears in all of those. And in order to go on a frequency list for pedagogy, for pedagogical purposes, it has to have frequency more than some number and a range of more than some number of the uh, subcorpora, the small uh, pieces of the corpus, range being what I showed you a little while ago. Okay, so with that, I click on get. Okay, so it goes looking, and uh, once again, it's 8 million words, so it takes a little while for it to come out. Okay, so this is for family in this corpus. This is British Academic Written English, 8 million words. And this tells you the frequency by subcorpus. Okay, you can see it's 316 times in medicine, 311 times in health, and so on. And down here are the instances of this word. So all of this makes a big, huge frequency list. And there it is as it appears in agriculture, then archaeology, then uh, Okay, I'm looking over here, biology, and so on, until maybe by the time you get all the way to the end, you can see U.S. studies, so whatever their categories are, sociology, and so on. So this should be a really good way to study this word for anybody who wants to know totally what this word means. There's several thousand examples of it as used in all these fields. However, all we want to know for our frequency list for pedagogy, we want to know the frequency and the range. So we go back to the top again. Okay, so we can see that there are 2,279 hits in that corpus. Okay, so we might say that that makes it a very frequent word or a medium frequency word, depending on what else we this is the number per million. Again, this is what is usually used, so it's 335 per million. So that's the number of hits times the size of the corpus. And then the range of this thing, which is over here where my cursor is, 
it appears in 28 out of the 30 corpora. So usually when building a pedagogical frequency list, you have frequency and range as your considerations. So it's not just any words by frequency because your corpus could be biased towards anything from ice hockey to uh, philosophy. And so it has to be a corpus with numerous parts and it has to have a range of more than, usually it's 20 out of 30 in order to, uh, to count. But obviously family is a very common word. It's got high frequency and it has got a great range. Okay, so when I can do that for lots and lots and lots of words, and I can finally get myself a frequency list. So that's what a corpus is. So to go from a corpus to a frequency list, this is a very short version of how this would work. Because obviously I said it needs to be frequency and range. I'm just going to do frequency right now just so that you get an idea. Okay, so this is a corpus list build. Over here, we have lots of these corpora. So this is a general corpus. It's called the Brown. It's a corpus of American English from the 1970s. And these are all different kinds of corpora. Actually, let me use this one. It's a new, new corpus. The COCA is the Corpus of Contemporary American English. This is just the sampler. It's actually the largest corpus in the world at the moment which is 400 million, I think. But anyway, this is just a sampler, so I'll use that. So I can make various settings here, and then just click. Ah, oh, forget that one. Go back to brown. I know it works. Okay, so it goes and it finds all of those words, the frequency for all of those words. So obviously a word like the is the most frequent, then a word like of, so there's 70,000 instances of the, so they're sorted by frequency. And I'm not doing range in this case, just to save time, but normally range would be a factor also. Okay, so I take this, and now I have to organize this, so I select all that, and um, do the usual copy, so it's in memory. Now I go back to my, I want to make this list into not just a list of individual words, but a list of families. So I go to this thing called Familizer. Oh, okay. No, no, I've got it. Okay, so all of that list is now uh, pasted into, into this thing called Familizer. Okay, yes, sorry, I'm taking a question now. I believe uh, Janet was, um, you, you had uh, asked her to return to her question. This might be the time to do that. Okay, well, Janet, I showed you th that uh, vocab profile thing, which shows the importance of uh, the first thousand, the second thousand, because the first thousand is, you know, 80%, and the, and the first 2,000 together are 90% are in that particular corpus, et cetera. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that, I got that. So I think what I need to do is um, maybe find, I don't think it's written in our program anywhere, but um, to find out like secondary three level, how many thousands of words should they know? And secondary four yeah. level, how many of the first thousand words they should know? Um, so that we can figure out if our texts are really at the right level. I think that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, you've got to interpret, but I think you can easily match the profile of the learner against the profile of the text. And if the learner has nothing at 1,000, then your text is at 3,000, then you know you've got uh, an, an issue there. Right, but my question is, how do we know that our texts are at the right level? Well, you have to get the texts and uh, digitize them and put them through vocab profile. Yeah. I'm just thinking that sometimes I think we use texts that are too difficult for the students at their level of what's expected of their level. So um, we have to be careful. We have to be careful of uh, making sure that our texts are not too difficult and making sure our students have enough vocabulary uh, to be able to understand them. Because you're right, sometimes it's not about the grammar. It's really about the vocabulary. They just lack vocabulary to understand the text. That's true. I couldn't agree more. So, 
Thanks for that. Shall I just carry on with this, or do you have more questions? This might seem elementary, um, but I'm I'm trying to figure out dolt sight words or sight words versus common. The most frequent thousand common words are is are the sight words included in that, or are they two just kind of separate brand names of the same concept? Just something I've been curious about. High frequency words should be sight words, which just means that uh, the learner doesn't have to uh, think about them. They just know what they mean. So, but they they should be the one k, and and then the two k should be sight words. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you for that. I I used to teach um, sight words, so now I realize I can just kind of expand upon that idea and. I guess right. Dolch is just one of the many groupings that there are. Well, they're the same grouping. It's just that they emphasize that they should that those words should be not just known but really well known. And uh, you know, they, they should the learner shouldn't have to puzzle over any of those words. They should just know them, like cat and dog and big and little and words like that. They they, they shouldn't uh, when they hear them or when they see them. It, it's it's a sight word. In other words, it can it can just be seen and understood instantly. Sorry, I don't want to talk too much in this uh, video conference, but um, it resonates with me because I like to create material. Um, I think that when we're creating material, sometimes we want to get really creative and do something that uh, um, that the students that that will have appeal to the students. Um, but what I see from this is that. I think that teachers have to have some sort of consensus or at least look at the, uh, the material that already exists, learning situations that exist, and try to build on the same themes or same ideas so that the students are building vocabulary. Because otherwise, they see it once and they don't learn it. Um, they, they never get the opportunity to use it outside of that learning situation. Whereas if we have learning situations that are on the same themes, same subjects, same ideas, um, the vocabulary will reappear and students will be learning more. That's what I'm getting from this. I, I think that is correct. But you can probably use some of this software to to get more out of the materials you've already got. That, that program that has the shared vocabulary would tell you to sequence this text after that text so that, you know, so there's more shared, for example. You don't have to start from scratch. I, that's what I would say. And also to build in uh, graded readers, which I was going to talk about. But, uh, shall I talk about graded readers? Says yes. Because it, you can add those to what you've got now, and students can be working away on their graded reader uh, at home because they're quite addictive and, and, uh, and very good for them and doesn't need to take class time. All they need to do is come up to talk to the teacher for one minute and when they finish one and have a discussion about it. Um, I used these in adult ed when I was uh, working with a guy in uh, one of these centers. But let me get my computer back and just show you where they are. If I go to that uh, this uh, FGA thing again, over at the bottom here is the greatest stories. and uh, that is a huge collection of graded stories at all different levels. So there, there are three sets, one's from Oxford, one's from Penguin, one's from Cambridge. And there's more from Oxford, but uh, lots of everything. And it's sort of by frequency. So, for example, if I take here uh, this story, Elephant Man, and you can see it's like this. So it needs a bit of formatting maybe in Word documents uh, or PDFs or whatever. This is obviously designed for the computer to enjoy more than uh, anybody. But if I take this text and stick it all into memory and then go to um, vocab profile, the one that I showed you and is on your uh, sheet there, and put in uh, Elephant Man, the entire text of Elephant Man, and say submit. 
and it might be too big for it. No, there it is. Okay, so you see the level? K1, 97.8%. So if your learner has, is like in, in, they've only got a few words in K1, then this is going to be useful for them. And, and of course, these are the proper nouns like I showed you before. So it's uh, really, really useful. And um, similarly, if I go to uh, a slightly higher uh, graded reader, okay, so if I go down to a higher level, to level six, uh, Cold Comfort Farm, uh, good story that I have read. And then I go back to vocab profile again, stick it in there. So what do you predict it'll be? Well, I don't know exactly, but I predict it'll be 2,000 and a bit of 3,000. It's got a lot yeah, of work to do to get all, all those words I, matched against uh, these big frequency lists. I was going to guess like a K6, but it, it just goes to show that a level 6 still has a large frequency of the lower the lower groups of words still something to wrap my head around yeah no level six is for native speakers okay there we go okay so that that's an example if you use this sometimes you got to give it a bit of time if it's like a whole novel it's uh, it can be quite uh, hard work and, and sometimes it'll uh, poop out and you know just stop but anyway, not often. Okay, so for that, uh, you know, the most advanced of the graded readers, so K1 and K2, K1 gives you 91, K2 gives you 96. So remember that 95 is sort of the threshold where people can just about cope. So at 95, so more than 95, so with 2K. So for people who have got 1K kind of down, this will give them... It's only 5%, but that is typical of, uh, of how the language is uh, statistically organized. And, um, and then down here, another 1% for K3 and K4. So that is pretty much... So, so the simple ones are heavy on K1, and then the more advanced ones get into some K2. So that, that's basically what happens with those. So I would say you could, in your syllabus, you could add graded readers. You know, it doesn't have to be those ones of mine where we get by class sets or whatever. But you can use mine, too. I don't think anyone would ever uh, worry about it. And, um, yeah, if you ever want to get those from Lex Tutor main page, just go to this thing called Book Box, and uh, graded readers are here. So they're inside this little place like that and um, some of these are probably a little bit more advanced but for people with very low scores like you saw on that uh, set of tests that Lori gave me those uh, people they need to do lots of work at 1k I mean even this person uh, they need to read and look up and, and discuss at 1k a, a lot So um, you can give them those difficult tasks, tasks because texts and tasks because yes, they have to do that in real life. But they should also get stuff that's closer to their level. Even even this, they will find graded readers, uh, the simplest ones, uh, not not simple. Well, um, our time is up for for the afternoon, um, um, but uh, we really. Appreciate everyone that came out today. Well, we want to thank you, Professor Cobb, for for being with us today and taking time out of your schedule for analyzing the data and putting together that really nice package. I want to apologize. I didn't know if they should be in Word or not, so I apologize for that extra work that caused you. Uh, but it was really, uh, to quote Caroline, to eye-opening to see the results and to see what they mean. Um, so uh, well, I want to thank you for that. Well, it's, it's for sure you've got a mismatch for, <laughs> with some students and materials. There's no doubt.
if I could get my hands on an exam, as I've said, I would uh, be able to tie it all together. Yep. Well, uh, we can definitely discuss that. Um, all right. Uh, oh, okay. So it, it looks like uh, for comments and questions, we're okay for now. Um, so uh, again, everybody, um, thank you very much for joining us. I will be emailing a link out later when this webinar is will be available to be viewed online afterwards. I can tell you, at least for myself, there's a lot of um, things that Professor Cobb covered, so I'll be looking forward to watching it again um, to get a better handle on some of those more advanced level tools that you showed us. So, uh, yeah, you can look forward to that email and uh, the next webinar, which unfortunately will be just with me. <laughs> But uh, I look forward to you joining us at the next one as well. So thanks, everyone. If anybody wants to email me, uh, there's a link on lextutor.ca at the bottom, which goes, which gives you a little thing that goes straight to my email, a little window. So Excellent. you can write in there, and I will get it. Thank you for offering that.